Grace and peace to you from the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. To start this sermon, I'd like to take, I'd like to take you back ten years and across the border into sunny Mexico, which seems like a pretty good place to be today. We had traveled south for a cousin's wedding. The worship service was in the evening, downtown at a beautiful colonial-era church. From there, we rode across town to the venue for the reception. Dinner and cocktails were delightful. And then they brought in the band and opened up the dance floor. My evening went south in a hurry, and I'll tell you why, as long as you promise not to tell anyone else. I am not the world's best dancer. There are many people who have a natural gift for movement, and there are many people who grow up in cultures that instill and value an ability to dance. Many, if not most, of the people gathered for the celebration that night fell into one or both of these categories. I myself don't really have either of these things going for me. So as people flooded the dance floor, I turned to Andrea and I said, this is so not fair. Think about how I'm going to look on that dance floor. There are 200 Latin people here, and me. <laughs> While the prophet Joel does make a passing reference to a bride and a groom, a wedding feast is probably far from our minds today as we gather up for worship on Ash Wednesday and begin our observance of Lent. But the words of the prophet have me thinking about dancing anyway. Twice the prophet calls for people to play the trumpet, providing music. Like so many other occasions when people dance, there's a call for people to come together. Everyone from infants to elders, even brides and grooms are called to lead their celebrations and join with the whole people of God. And the repetition of the prophet's words begin to form a rhythm that people, well, people other than me, can dance to. Turn to God with all your heart. Turn to the Lord your God, God may turn and leave a blessing. The music, the gathering, the turning, yes, the prophet is giving a word of warning, but he's also giving us an invitation. The prophet is telling us that God says, let's dance. The message the prophet Joel brings to God's people is unusual compared to the other prophets in the sense that he doesn't call God's people to account for a specific way they failed to love God or love neighbor. All we know is that the people are experiencing a calamity caused by falling out of step with God, by dancing to their own tune and insisting that they have to lead. The people have fallen so far out of step with God that they assumed the coming day of the Lord that day when God would settle all accounts would be a day to look forward to. But the prophet is letting them know that the day of the Lord will be more of a dirge, a day of darkness and gloom, than a day for dancing if they refuse to get back in step with God. This day, Ash Wednesday, is a day when we as a community are more upfront than usual about, uh, more upfront than usual about acknowledging that we are out of step with God dancing to our own tunes, and insisting on leading. The words of confession that we'll speak together in a few moments are unique because of their length and because of their detail. They're also unique because while we close them by asking for God's forgiveness, they're the only words of confession we speak all year that are not followed by an immediate assurance of God's forgiveness. This leaves us in the same place as the prophet, who tells us, who knows whether God will turn or, and relent or not. These are hard words for us to hear. They remind us that God doesn't owe us forgiveness. God is not under any obligation to give us second chances. But the silver lining in all those dark clouds the prophet preaches about is that even though we've fallen out of step with God, even though we love dancing to our own tune and we insist on leading, even though we are dust and to dust we shall return, God still loves us enough to turn to us and to still invite us and say, let's dance. Joel brings us the word from God that even now, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. The season we're turning to today will lead us to the cross the place where we tried to make God dance to our tune. 
And it will lead us to the empty tomb, where God got creation back in step. These 40 days are all about learning how we can better respond to God's invitation when God says to us, let's dance. For those of us who don't have natural rhythm, and when it comes to staying in step with God, that's each and every one of us. Scripture shows us some ways we can move that will start to put us back in step with God. Joel and Jesus say that we can start to get back in step with God through fasting. Both of them make it clear that turning yourself into a spectacle while doing so is not what gets you back in step with God. But fasting does help us understand and become more willing to respond to people who don't have a choice about going hungry. We can get back in step with God through weeping, through truly examining and acknowledging the real damage we have done and the real hurt we have caused to one another, to God's creation, and to God. We can get back in step with God through mourning, through clearly and courageously naming what's wrong in the world and responding to it as the Holy Spirit gives us the ability. Each of these and the many other spiritual disciplines we practice throughout Lent can help us get back in step with God. They can make it easier for us to respond to God when God says, let's dance. While it's certainly possible to dance alone, most of the time when we dance, we do so on occasions when we gather with other people. This is exactly what Joel has in mind when he gathers the people together for worship. Worship together matters. Because turning back to God isn't just about each of us as individuals. It's about the whole community of God's people because how we turn toward or how we turn away from God impacts everyone around us. Gathering as a community matters because as we learn ways of getting back in step with God, we can encourage one another. We can learn from one another. We can lovingly hold one another accountable. Let these 40 days we begin tonight be an opportunity to gather in community for study, for fellowship, and for worship as we help one another learn these dance moves and get back in step with God. Now I can tell you from personal experience that learning some dance moves is good and helpful, but it's having an innate sense of rhythm that really matters. In the same way, all the fasting, weeping, and mourning in the world won't really put us back in step with God if our hearts aren't in the right place. Rend your heart and not your clothing, as Joel says, pointing to the importance of getting the rhythm of our hearts right so we can truly dance with God. But if we could get our hearts right on our own, we would just need some clear instructions, and we would not need a crucified and risen Savior. The ashes that are going to be pressed onto our heads in a few minutes remind us that God created us from the dust and that we will return to that dust. The crucified and risen Savior's tomb that we'll gather around 40 days from now gives us the promise that God can and does reform that dust into new hearts, new hearts that can stay in step with God and beat with the rhythm of new life. Whether you have the gift of rhythm and dance, or whether you have two left feet. These 40 days to come are a time for us to listen to God's invitation. Let's dance. No matter how far we've fallen out of step with our divine dance partner, God's love and grace still call to us. Let's dance. And when we have returned to the dust, we know that even then, God of the resurrection will call us from the dust of the earth and say, Let's dance. Thanks be to God.